Now, our uh, first speaker of the afternoon session is the clinical director for the lab in Beaumont Hospital and the Hermitage Medical Clinic, is an honorary associate clinical professor at the Royal College of Surgeons. He's the chair of the Lymphoma and Haematology Group at Cancer Trials Ireland and the national principal investigator in Ireland for the CLL-13 study. He is the leading CLL expert. Uh, his uh, particular areas of interest include P53 deletion and Richter transformation, myelodysplasia and thrombocytopenia. It's so Richter transformation. No, I'm going to start again. Richter transformation, myelodysplasia and immune tribal thrombocytopenia. Thank you. It's so much easier introducing politicians, I have to say, than medical experts. Minister for... Uh, anyway, look, he is, he is a, a world-class expert in his field. That's all I really need to say. By the way, I should say at the outset, he's also in huge demand. If his uh, buzzer goes off or his beeper goes off, he is going to have to run out of the room, and I think we can all understand the reasons for that, and none of us will complain if that is the case. But in the meantime, please give a warm welcome to Professor Patrick Thornton. Uh, thanks, thanks for that introduction. Uh, it's, it's good when you get to my age that you collect titles instead of <laughs> illnesses or complaints. Um, so th thanks very much. You're very kind. Um, I, I, I'm delighted to be back here again. Uh, CLL is my major interest and, and was my, the subject of research I did when I was a younger man. And um, <clears throat> I'm delighted to be in the position that CLL has is, is, is made so much headway with regards to uh, therapeutics. It's become a very interesting disease. And um, what I plan to do t t uh, over the next sort of 45 minutes is take you on this sort of journey that I have lived through from a sort of hematology specialist registrar, a research fellow and, uh, and a consultant, and sort of witness these changes. And uh, I've kind of put the dinosaur there to sort of represent chemotherapy because I think um, uh, we're coming to an era now where we may be able to do away with chemotherapy um, for CLL. And what I want to do is the first half is to take you through how we've progressed and how we treated CLL and how we investigated it. Apologies, a lot of the slides are, are, are fairly medical, but I mean, I will talk you through them. And I think most of you uh, are probably well versed in interpreting these slides if you've come to many of these uh, venues before. Um, so, uh, so I've given the title, The National History of, Ke of CLL, and is this the end of chemotherapy? And we can decide when the lecture's finished whether you feel that it is or not. Um, so CLL is the, as you know, is the commonest leukemia in the Western world. And what makes it interesting is that it's, it's what's called, has a heterogeneous nat natural history. So, I mean, some people do extremely well and need only surveillance. Uh, some people are less fortunate. Um, and it, it, it does threaten their life and their longevity. And the top uh, picture is the bone marrow of somebody with CLL. Your bone marrow, once you reach the age of 50, I mean, it, it, it normally 50% of it's full of fat cells, but you can see this bone marrow has been overwhelmed by a kind of monomorphic population of the leukemia. The next slide, um, yeah, yeah. The next slide is what CLL looks like in the blood, these sort of lymphocyte cells. And CLL can affect the bone marrow and also increase uh, your lymph nodes can be seen in your neck, under the arms, in the groin, and enlarge the spleen. Um, and the, the, the tumour bulk tends to be associated with, with greater uh, genetic risks to the chromosomes of the leukaemia and a greater genetic complexity as the disease progresses. And at the very uh, end of the spectrum is a condition called monoclonal B lymphocytosis, where somebody has a white cell count, a lymphocyte count of less than five, uh, in their peripheral blood, they are clonal and they have the same immunological fingerprint as CLL. And this is a commoner condition uh, in people who have relatives of CLL. But the majority of these individuals will not progress to CLL and only need surveillance. Those that have a lymphocyte count over five, it's called a stage A CLL, and many of them won't progress. They may have uh, small lymph nodes in, in one or two areas, uh, but have a reasonable hemoglobin and platelets. And then CLL progresses, and we can talk about what that progression is that may require treatment. Uh, some people are unfortunate enough that the treatment doesn't work, uh, 
that's called refractory CLL, and then around 10% of people can develop a transformation of their CLL into something which resembles more like a hybrid lymphoma, um, and certainly is a difficult condition to treat, uh, and there, there isn't even a, a recognized gold standard, and so that is, even today, unfortunately, a, a great threat, uh, and certainly is, it, it can be fatal in, in many individuals. And this progression of CLL normally goes along with progression of our prognostic markers. And sometimes you can collect these poor prognostic markers as your disease progresses. Uh, uh, you may or may not, but this is associated with more aggressive and more refractory disease. And this is kind of called clonal insta instability or the genetic instability, which we see in all cancers. And when we're talking about these markers, if I took cells from your cheek and looked at the chromosomes, they're the chromosomes you're born with. But if we look at the chromosomes of the leukemia, they have different abnormalities, or, uh, and they are the chromosomes of the leukemia, which leads to its, its instability and, 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 and its progression. And I'm just going to show you very quickly a few survival curves. And what that means is 100% of people are still alive at zero. And as the years progress, uh, um, the, the, you know, the patients die with time. And uh, the dotted line is what's called age match control. So these are people who don't have CLL, and the black line is those that do. And so for a proportion of people that have good prognostic markers, they're stage naught, they have a mutation of their immunoglobulin gene, they, uh, the CLL has no impact on their overall survival, and so and many of these don't need treated. And uh, this you know, was an opinion of CLL, which is, still exists today, but it's important to realize that this... <coughs> It's important to realize two things. One, this, this population does exist, but unfortunately this is only the minority of patients. So doctors, hematologists and oncologists shouldn't become complacent of CLL, that it's, a, that it's a benign disease that they can ignore. Because if we look at people who have a unmutated immunoglobulin gene, they do die of their CLL, as you can see. And overall, the younger you are, the greater this threat is to your life. Uh, and overall, even the older patients, CLL does kill people, uh, without a doubt, as you can see from these graphs. Um, but as I said at the beginning, there are certain things that we can do to determine who are the population of people who, tend, who only need to see uh, their doctor once a year versus those people who will need more frequent observation and those people who may require treatment and, and what that treatment should be. And around the turn of the millennium, they looked into the chromosome abnormalities of the leukemia. There are a few of them. And as you can see, the dark line where people, where all those patients have succumbed to their disease at around 80 months are those with a P53 deletion, which is contained on the short arm or the P arm of chromosome 17. Uh, and the people who do well, who are at the top, who probably have a similar life expectancy to people who don't have CLL, have a 13Q deletion. And the other chromosomes or something in between. Um, the other major prognostic marker that I've already alluded to is what's called a mutation or unmutation of your immunoglobulin gene. Now, what that means is uh, our immune system, we're born with uh, genes which instruct our body to make antibody to antigen, and antigens are contained on infection, germs, viruses, etc. To increase the diversity of our response to what's called antigenic stimuli, which in general is infection, etc. Uh, we can mutate that gene to give us a greater diversity of the immunoglobulin gene. So it's a more mature B cell, whereas the unmutated is sort of what's called similar to germline, and it's the B cell that you were kind of born with. So it's a more active B cell, a more immature, naive B cell, and those with an unmutation tend to have a more reactive CLL, which is more likely to require treatment. And this, is, this kind of splits up the prognostic markers uh, to good prognosis versus, versus bad prognosis. And so they are part of the markers that we would consider doing to give people an idea of what type of CLL they have, whether it's going to require treatment or may not, or may just require surveillance. And <clears throat> over the years, uh, we've, we've learned an awful lot of CLL, especially from the turn of the century, and there's been a huge morass of stuff that we know about CLL and how it interacts with the bone marrow and the microenvironment. And fortunately, uh, that has gone along with an increase in the knowledge of the disease behavior. It's gone along with an increase of the knowledge in how we treat the disease, which I'll talk more about as we go on. So just to repeat to you, the, the heterogeneity or variability of CLL 
a quarter of patients will never require treatment and will have a normal life expectancy and just need surveillance blood count. It's important to realize that almost half the patients are over 75, so that will have an impact on what treatment we use to treat this leukemia, because when you're dealing with any treatment, the things you have to bear in mind are a triangle of performance status, efficacy, and toxicity. And what that means is, are you fit enough for the treatment? Does the treatment work? And are you gonna survive the treatment? Or is it gonna make you more sick than the disease itself? So it's important to realize that the majority of patients, and thankfully in Ireland, are, uh, as we get older, we also get fitter, but that does limit the treatments that may be available to them because of their age. And even now, or perhaps no longer, you can tell me what you think when the, when the lecture is over, but it's considered that the only prognostic marker that really influences your treatment is a deletion of P53 on the short arm of chromosome 17. So, um, there are agreed, international agreed indications for treatment, and anybody who's ever seen me will be tired hearing this <laughs> from me, but I am very pedantic about it, uh, because uh, haematologists tend to be laboratorians, they tend to like science fiction, Star Trek, and they tend to like definite blacks and whites, and uh, so we like that there is a, a, a certain degree of uh, objectivity in the decision which you make to give someone treatment. There aren't any treatments with without side effects, even the modern ones, and uh, the older you get, the more illnesses you can collect and the more symptoms you can also collect. And uh, it's very important to realize that not everyone feels perfect, but to understand that if someone does feel unwell, that the reason they're feeling unwell is the CLL and not something else. Um, because it, it can be a disease that can just be watched. There's no benefit in treating disease that doesn't need treated. So there's this long list of uh, reasons of why we treat it, and I'm not going to go through it, I'm just too aware that it's there. But I can summarize that before treatment, what I consider is the four uh, P's. And the first P is, is the disease progressing? Is it getting worse? Um, is the person developing a, high, a very rapidly and rising white count? increasing lymph nodes, losing weight, etc. Is there evidence of progression? Is there what's called peripheral cytopenias? Now what that means is your bone marrow uh, will make three cell lines, the hemoglobin, which carries oxygen around the body, the platelets, which stop you bleeding if you cut yourself, and, uh, and the white cells, which contain lymphocytes, which are your leukemia, but also neutrophils, which uh, help fight infection. So peripheral cytopenias means these are reduced. In other words, you could be anemic and when you finally got it on the third attempt, thrombocytopenia, which means you've got low platelets, or even neutropenia. Um, now, there, the, the reason that that would require treatment in CLL is if the bone marrow, like you saw on the very first picture, is completely wiped out by the CLL and your bone marrow can't function properly. It's called marrow failure. It's certainly a, a reason to treat it. But there are other reasons for having low counts in CLL, and this can be autoimmune, such as immune thrombocytopenia, hemolytic anemia, where you're destroying your red cells, or immune neutropenia. And when you have CLL, your immune system, unfortunately, becomes slightly what's called anergic or slightly incompetent. And so your ability for your immune system to control its own response to stuff becomes impaired. And that is not just an increase in infection, but there's also an increase in its regulation. So your immune system can make cells that it shouldn't, which will destroy your platelets or destroy your red cells. And these are called autoimmune cytopenias. And it's important to know why someone's anemic. With, with, with that, is it immune, is it CLL, or is it just simply they need iron or they need B12 or they need folate? For example, colonic cancer is a lot more common than CLL, and the older we get, the more common it is. So it's important if someone's anemic to make sure that they don't just have low iron because they're bleeding from somewhere. And again, as I said at the beginning, not to blame CLL for every complaint. Um, and that's important to have that knowledge. Performance status, as I've said, will determine what treatment you're able to give. You may have the best treatment in the world, but there's no point in giving it to you if it kills your patient. Yeah? So, uh, and, and that will come through uh, in the, the rest of this talk. And, and, and performance status certainly has driven the way CLL treatment has gone. Uh, because uh, as, as will become apparent, there are some very good treatments in CLL which you can't give to the majority of people who have CLL. And again, the P53 determines what treatment you get and that I will explain why. So, just a reminder again, a quarter of people will never need treatment and 
they are likely to be female, they're likely to have a 13Q deletion, and they're likely to have a mutation of the immunoglobulin gene. So these are what is known as the good prognostic markers, which generally translate uh, as uh, n not needing treatment and, and good longevity. Peripheral cytopenias that I've alluded to, there are many reasons of why they can happen. And before treating someone, we need to know why you have these peripheral cytopenias. And what about the P53? And I, 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 I'm beginning to sound like I'm harping on a bit too, a bit too much about it, but uh, P53 uh, in any cancer, and CLL is not unique, um, will worsen the prognosis. This is a protein which is uh, uh, 53 kilodaltons, that's the weight of it, which is why it's called uh, P53. It's contained on the short armor chromosome 17, and when you damage cells, either by radiotherapy or by chemotherapy or by cancer itself, then this protein is recruited to kill the cell off. And when a cell dies, that's called apoptosis, that's called cell death. Without that protein, the chemotherapy will only get so far and the cell won't die off, and then it develops either resistance, early relapse uh, to chemotherapy. So that's why, if you remember the very first survival curve that I showed you, that's why P53 can be lethal and certainly bad in anyone that has it in CLL and indeed any cancer. Now, how do we determine whether someone has this abnormality or not? Uh, we know that it's contained on the short arm of chromosome 17. <laughs> So uh, when we're looking at our chromosomes, the problem with CLL is the cells don't divide that quickly. So we have to look, we have to insert little probes into the cell so, uh, to see whether the CLL, the, 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 the disease, is, the, the genetic material is deleted or missing. If you look on that little picture on the right, I don't know how well it comes out. You'll see there's two green dots in all of the cells. And they are probes for what's called the center mirror, the center of your chromosome 17. And you can barely see a tiny, tiny red dot because it's a tiny little probe. And that probe is for the P53. And you'll see that a majority of those cells, and these were cells in a, a UK CLL4 uh, trial done in the UK, and uh, where this was screened for all patients. And these were the days when we still did chemotherapy to people who had P53 deletion. But you'll see a proportion of those uh, individuals are missing one red dot which means they're missing the P53, which means they've got a P53 deletion. The other thing you may hear is something called a P53 mutation. Now, they know it, which means that the genetic material is confused or mixed up, and so the protein is not manufactured, and so therefore your P53 doesn't work, and therefore you'll do badly. Um, they usually occur together. Um, and when we, this is my own handiwork, but when we did the sequencing of the gene. So we're looking at the actual genetic material, your genetic DNA code uh, that, that writes the P53. We pick up the mutations here, which you see these little black arrows. Now back then, that sequencing was done on a gel, which would have been the size of that window uh, in a room this size, and it would have taken about three days. Yeah, And that was called Sanger sequencing, where you read the DNA. Um, so it was you know, not amenable to everywhere. Um, that was done in what's called the, the Bob Champion laboratory. You may remember he was a jockey and he sponsored these labs in the Marsden. But nowadays, P53 uh, can be done with something called next generation sequencing, which is a lot quicker. And the machine which does it is about the size of this podium. Not only that, it can be done at a much deeper level where you can pick up smaller and smaller probes. So that is kind of the way forward. And in even the fish, which you see there, fluorescent in situ, hybridization, uh, again, it's even quicker and more sensitive to that. So that's probably the way forward in how we detect P53 in the future. How is it important? If you look at any trial where chemotherapy was used, if you have a P53 deletion, you do worse. And so these days, it's generally accepted in most countries that treat CLL, and certainly all of them in Europe, that if you have a P53 deletion, uh, you should not have chemotherapy, ever. You should have something else. Um, and um, that's just a reminder of the slide I showed you. And why am I saying that? Because 
Although we have very good combination chemotherapy and what's called fludarabine, cyclophosphamide and rituximab, although it improves almost everyone else, the P53 makes no difference. So the improvement in chemotherapy over the years has improved how we respond with the other bad prognostic markers. It has done pretty much zero in the improvement in survival or of, P50, of people with P53 deletion. So therefore, if you have a P53 deletion, you shouldn't get chemotherapy at all, ever. Okay, so how about the people who don't have P53 and how about chemotherapy? And I just showed you this graph on FCR and it looks absolutely fantastic and uh, people do very well. And uh, there was a, a poster at ASH uh, now seven years ago where they found that a cohort of patients in the MD Anderson treated by FCR chemotherapy uh, still have no evidence of CLL 10 years out, so they're probably cured. That's brilliant. But if you look at the paper, you'll find that they were only really able to finish it in about a quarter of the patients. And it is only about a quarter of the patients that actually got the, uh, the, uh, the long-term remission. And only about a quarter of CLL patients would be fit enough for FCR in the first place. So a quarter of a quarter of a quarter. Okay. And that's where we get uh, where toxicity affects what you can give. So you may have a very good treatment, um, but... You may, it may not be available to everyone. One way around that was they said, well, maybe we'll shorten the amount of FCR that we give people. You know, only about, about half people got four in the courses instead of six. And so this Australian group looked at people who got four cycles of FCR and looked how well they'd done and see if we could abbreviate the FCR. And one way of determining how well you're doing in CLL is to measure the amount you've got left in your bone marrow. That's called minimal residual disease. There's various ways of doing that. But people who are what's called MRD negative, which means they'd less than one in 10 or even 100,000 CLL cells in their bone marrow, uh, were called MRD negative. They stopped the treatment. They thought they'd done well enough, and they did just as well as people who had six cycles. Again, good. It's a way of reducing the toxicity of the chemotherapy by saying we can stop early because you've done well enough. Um, and, you know, about a third of, uh, and this is about 300 patients who got CLL, so these are fit patients, but even at that, as good as it is, less than a third are still in a long-term remission, okay? Um, so, uh, then they looked at detoxifying CLL and making the chemotherapy more appropriate to the age group and performance status of the people who needed treatment. And they brought out this drug called bendamustine and they compared it with FCR. And this is in the German CLL-10 trial. And they found that if you're over 65, that you did as well with bendamustine as you would for fludarabine. And then that became the sort of treatment for older, slightly fitter patients. And then they took that one step further again. And then they, they looked at a less toxic drug called chlorambucil. And all of these, um, all of these treatment regimens are what's called chemoimmunotherapy. And what that means is you have chemotherapy and you have a targeted monoclonal antibody. And your CLL cells, if you have them, express something called CD20. It's on the cell surface. And you can have an antibody to the CD20. And we have one called rituximab. There's one called abinutuzumab, which is slightly more powerful. And it's a sort of more targeted therapy with less toxicities than chemo. And so when you combine that with chemo, you get a better result. And so what they did as the chemo immunotherapy regimens progressed, they lessened the chemo and made the antibody better. And that's with this CLL11 trial where they just used chlorambucil, um, which is a fairly low toxicity chemo with a better antibody called abinutuzumab, and found that people did pretty well. And if you look at bendamustine rituximab, remember, which in the older people is almost as good as FCR, um, you can see that you got a fairly reasonable overall response rate. Now, yes, it's not as good, but if you look at the population, they were older, 74. A SEER score uh, stands for cumulative illness rating score. So if you have high blood pressure and you have treatment for it, you get a 2. If you've got ischemic heart disease and you've got a treatment for it, you get a 4. If you've got thyroid disease, you get a 6. You get the picture. So the SEER score, most of the people in the Thrombosil, the Benetuzumab trial was eight, so they had either four illnesses that were medicated for or three that they were medicated for twice. So more representative of what they call real world um, population. Um, and they did pretty well, overall response rate 77. Um, but if you look at the amount of severe neutropenia, it's less than 10% versus over a quarter of the people who got the bendamustine. So that is sort of now then was advised as the 
chemo immunotherapy regimen for older people and you could argue that older people or less fit people represents the majority of CLL treatment. So that's where we got to um, uh, with chemo immunotherapy. Uh, perhaps we got to the stage where we've got an overall response rate of 77% in the majority of older less fit patients which represent the majority of CLL patients. So, but what, what, what are our gaps? We've no real treatment for P53. And, you know, well, there's obviously room to improve in 77, as good as, as, as it sounds to you, because that 77% in four years, most of them, their CIO will have come back again. Um, so there's obviously room for improvement. Now, before I go on to the sort of second half of the sort of changes in treatment, just to remind you, some patients shouldn't have treatment at all. Some patients should not have chemotherapy, and maybe by the end of this, we should say nobody should have chemotherapy. But some patients definitely shouldn't, and they have a P, they're the ones with a P53 deletion. And one thing which I can say with absolute certainty, and I'll prove it to you in the next slides, is that patients should not have chemotherapy twice. Okay? And how do we identify who these patients are? So, who shouldn't have chemotherapy? And it's now in what's called the British Committee for Standards and Hematology Guidelines that to test for P53, and if you have it, you should not have chemotherapy because we have an alternative treatment which works um, and chemotherapy doesn't. Um, so the P53 should be tested for, but it should be tested for before treatment and at every treatment. And the reason I say that is because you may not have P53 when your CLL requires treatment the first time. But, as in many people, unfortunately, it comes back in relapse, you can then acquire it. And if you look at this graph, this, this, this is a mirror of the progression tree that I showed you in about the third slide. And the more your CLL progresses and the more unstable it gets, the more likelihood you have of acquiring this P53 abnormality. So, with every time your, a decision is made that you need your CLL to be treated, you should test the P53. So having it negative at diagnosis does not mean that it's negative at time of treatment, at time of second treatment, at time of third treatment. So it should be tested at every line of treatment. The ways of doing it is, as I've showed you in a little diagram, you can do it by fluorescent in situ hybridization. Uh, and, but nowadays they do it by something called next generation sequencing. And there's a whole committee in Europe which is looking at next generation sequencing um, uh, all over Europe, along with other genes, but importantly P53, and we collaborate with the UK Reference Centre in Belfast, with a guy called Mark Catherwood, and uh, we test this along with some other genes in all our CLL patients who are requiring treatment. Now, so if we're going to do away with chemotherapy, uh, what other ways can we use to kill CLL cells? Now, we know quite a bit about the various conversations going on with CLL and the other cells in your body and bone marrow. And that slide's not, I'm not going to explain that slide, it's just to demonstrate that. But essentially you can block interactions with T cells, you can block what's called the B cell receptor, and you can block something called BCL2. Don't worry, I'm going to explain to you what that means in a minute. Now, all of us can get infection. Think about what happens to you when you get a viral infection. Okay? You're lymphocyte count will go up and you might get swollen glands. Have any of you ever had even glandular fever or any significant viral infection? Then what happens, the infection goes away and the white cell count goes down again and your lymph nodes disappear. So how does that happen? Well, our body, when we get infection, the B cell, which, cell, uh, which is all B lymphocytes, is stimulated by something called the B cell receptor. So that's the on switch. So that makes the cells proliferate. But the cells are all programmed to die off. Now, to keep them alive, there's, uh, there, there's, there, there's something called BCL2, which is something called blocks apoptosis. So that's the off switch. So when we have an infection, the on switch is on, and the off switch is off. You with me? Yeah? So the off switch is BCL2, and the on switch is the B cell receptor. So the new therapies that we use now to treat CLL without chemotherapy or to block the B cell receptor, in other words, to switch off the on switch, or to block BCL2, which is to switch 
on the off switch. Have you got that? <laughs> yeah. Now, um, so the B cell receptor has various downstream chemicals. One's called Bruton's kinase. They discovered by this guy called General Bruton in America. Another one's called PI3 kinase. Uh, and and they're the the when they're the downstream activation markers, which makes your cell divide and move around and kind of be nasty to you. Um, now, if we block that, and one of the drugs to do that is something called a brutinib, um, then your CLL uh, gets switched off. And this is one of the survival curves in people who had already relapsed after chemotherapy, treated with uh, a brutinib in the black line versus uh, treatment naive. So you can see an extremely good response rate, and these included people with the P53 deletion. This is the, the CT scan of the very first person ever to get a Britnip for CLL in Europe. She was an 82-year-old woman from um, Griffith Avenue. <laughs> and, uh, and as you can see, I'm not, I, I, I imagine you interpret CT scans, but you can see that there's a lot less round things in there, which are the lymph nodes, after the treatment than there was before. And she lived for four years after having four or five rounds of chemotherapy uh, and died of old age, really, um, without brutinib. Now, the point is, she had been multi-treated with chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is no longer an option for her, but she had four years of brutinib, celebrated about anniversaries, et cetera, and got considerable more life out of it um, uh, because there was no real toxicities for her. Yeah, this is another B cell receptor uh, inhibitor called idolalacib. Uh, again, similar response rate to brutinib. It's kind of slightly um, less favorite than brutinib because it has slightly more side effects. It can cause inflammation in the gut and the, the lungs. So it's probably not used as much as brutinib is these days because more of the side effects. But another good drug, and it can be considered in, you know, where there are indications where you can't use brutinib. Now, what I didn't talk about, and I'm getting, it's getting more difficult for me to to try and be comprehensive about CLL, because I do understand that some people in the audience may have this disease and may be very young or fit. And uh, traditionally, a bone marrow transplant was considered in the treatment algorithm for CLL who didn't respond to chemotherapy, who had a P53 deletion. And it's difficult now to uh, you know, decide where to put this in, which is why I've sort of clumsily thrown it in in the middle. But it's important to realize is these, is a, these are all pretty top of the range transplant centers in Europe and America. And if you look, uh, they all got sort of an average of 100 or so patients. They're all refractory to chemotherapy. Some of them may have a P53 deletion. But look, you know, relapse at four years, almost half of all of them. And extensive GVHD. Now, I don't know whether there's any transplant people in the audience, but having GVHD is no walk in the park. It's like having really bad psoriasis. You might have chronic diarrhea, or you might have the equivalent of an emphysema because of GV lung. So it's not an easy thing. And what you've done is replace one chronic condition, the CLL, with another one called GVHD. And all the people who have transplants, half of them get GVHD, and less than half of them are cured, and the other half relapse after four years. So it may be the only option for someone previously a transplant, but it's, it's certainly not as good as you'd see for, you know, AML or CML or other conditions that we use it for. Um, and again, not an option for the majority of patients because of your overall background fitness. So the algorithm for, say, for having a transplant in CLL has pretty much changed that it used to be for fit chemorefractory people with P53 deletion, and it's now really only used in fit people where really even the novel agents have failed, such as ibrutinib or idolalacid. Now, what do we do when the disease comes back? So, um, so say you have a ibrutinib frontline for your P53 deletion and your disease comes back again, what do we do? Well, we have the other option where we can block, the, we can turn on we, the off switch, and that's called a BCL2 inhibitor. That drug's called venatoclax, okay? So now, we still don't need to use chemotherapy for relapse, and this drug has been used in clinical trials where they had relapsed patients, and this is why I say you should never have chemotherapy twice, uh, because they looked at a bendamustine rituximab versus the venatoclax, and the green line is the venatoclax, and the blue line is the bendamustine. Now, the, most people, will get about two years out of bendamustine rituximab 
uh, in relapse. You can see there in the graph. And it takes six months to give it. So you get six months of treatment for 18 months of remission. Your CLL comes back anyway. Versus venatoclax, we can see they do twice, three times as better. So this study is called the Murano study. Is now, uh, now the recommendations in Europe for him tells you that if you have whatever you get frontline, if your CLL comes back, chemotherapy is not the option for second line. So just to summarize what I'm trying to say is if you have a P53 deletion, you should never get chemotherapy ever. Get ibrutinib or a new drug. If you don't have a P53 deletion, you get chemotherapy first time. Uh, when the disease comes back, you shouldn't have chemotherapy again. You should get ibrutinib or venatoclax. And if you have ibrutinib and your disease comes back, you still have venatoclax. So we're not using chemotherapy in any of these situations other than frontline. Now, I'm anticipating a thought which is growing in all of your brains, if these treatments are so good, why the hell can't we just give them to everyone front line? We do that in myeloma, we do that in acute leukemia, why are the CLL the second class citizens? Okay, that's a reasonable question. Um, so, uh, what we did, we, 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 we agree, the sort of hematology community agrees, that we should look at bringing these treatments into the front line setting. Um, and we did that um, in a trial. Um, sorry, we did that. No, before I get to that, um, that has been looked at um, in various trials, mostly in America and around Europe. And these trials were presented at ASH, which was six months ago. And I just briefly, am I out of time? Yeah, I shall briefly just summarize them for you. So, first one is, First chemotherapy I talked to you about, FCR. We all thought it was brilliant, but not appropriate for everybody. So they compared FCR versus ibrutinib and rituximab. Randomization, FCR fit people. Um, ibrutinib and rituximab versus FC, uh, FC rituximab. Ibrutinib's better. Okay. So what about um, bendamustine? Sure, I said that was fantastic. Bendamustine, rituximab versus ibrutinib and rituximab. Randomization, a Britinib alone, a Britinib rituximab, bendamustine rituximab, a Britinib is better. And it doesn't really matter whether you give rituximab or not, a Britinib is better. Okay, but, you know, bendamustine, fridarabine, cyclophosphamide, they're fairly toxic, can't give that to everyone. You said, that, you know, most people should get carambacel and bendamustine. You know, it represents the bulk of CLL patients, the older patients, you know, 77% response. You're sure that's brilliant. What more do you want? It's low toxicity, you know, 6% severe neutropenia. Sure, it's great. So, you know, that bendamustine, FCR stuff, you're not representing the majority of the CLL cohort. Okay, well, I have that for you. So we have, uh, um, I'm just, because I've been talking a bit. So um, we have that as well. Um, we have um, chloramicil and abinutuzumab versus abrutinib. Abinutuzumab, abrutinib is better. Abrutinib is a lot better. And when you look at the safety, ibrutinib is even lower side effects than um, cramsil and benetuzumab. And cramsil and benetuzumab, they talk about minimal residual disease. You can also get that with the, the ibrutinib monoclonal antibody combination as well. So we now have trials done and completed and published in ASH that show that the novel agents are better than chemotherapy. We know they're better second line. We know they're better in P53. Now we know they're better in everything. Um, now, the only way uh, to uh, get novel agents frontline in Ireland currently is to enter a, a trial, um, which has been open and was open until August. And this trial looks at chemotherapy in fit patients versus abrutinib and abrutinib and venatoclax and abrutinib and venatoclax in the combinations. And the combination is re really that makes the most sense that it, not everyone may need it, but the combination is, as I've said to you, abrutinib switches off the on switch and venatoclax switches on the off switch so if we can combine the two then we'll have you know a very effective way of managing your CLL and uh, and if you throw an antibody in which again is low toxicity you may be even able to cure CLL in a number of vigils so this is uh, again back to our little scales of you know pro-life and anti-death in our and our cancer cells uh, and if we affect both those pathways we'll get effective cell killing for our CLL.
Okay, um, and we did that in a randomised trial, which were running in a number of centres in Ireland, uh, Beaumont and James's, and the matter in Dublin, Galway and Cork and and uh, Waterford, and essentially only one in four people got chemotherapy, and the remaining three quarters got venetoclax plus an antibody, or venetoclax plus uh, ibrutinib, or venetoclax and an antibody plus uh, ibrutinib, and. Uh, we we're doing pretty well in recruiting that in that trial. And we, when we said uh, when we took it on, we said that Ireland would put in 30 people, and we've already put in 35, and we've got three more months to go. So Ireland's recruiting very well in it. Um, uh, people are doing very well in it. What I can tell you is that although this trial hasn't finished yet, and although um, although the results aren't published yet, there is a trial of a Britain of the class combination which will be presented at a conference soon, probably EHAR IWCLL, which shows that the combination of in, in Britain and Venatoclax, including P53 patients, has a overall response rate of 83%, which is better than FCR. And that includes the P53 population. Um, so we know from some trials already completed that a Britain and Venatoclax combination is excellent and not very toxic. So uh, I don't know what, how much time I've taken to do all that. Five minutes left. Perfect. Because I'm finished now. Yeah. So, so when I started this talk off, I tried to sell you chemo-free treatment for CLL. Is chemotherapy the dinosaur? Okay. So what's the next step? And uh, in about a year's time, or maybe a year and a half, we'll be opening another trial called CLL17. Now, I've signed what's called a non-disclosure agreement, so I can't tell you exactly what the arms are, but I'm sure you know. <laughs> what I can tell you is, frontline, all patients, P53 included, all ages, all level of fitness, all CLL patients go into the one trial, and there's no chemotherapy in it. That's called CLL17, and that should open Q3 2020. And so we put 35 in CLL, 13, that was sort of fit patients who didn't have a P53 deletion. My guess is we could put 100 in that. Um, so, so, so I think, you know, probably maybe not the 2020 CLL Ireland, but certainly the 2022 or whatever CLL Ireland, people won't be getting chemo. People probably won't be getting chemotherapy anymore. Uh, I remember about three or four years ago, I was doing one of these interviews at Ash, and it was... Um, John Gribbon was sort of interviewing us, and, and uh, the first question he says, he says, so Patrick, do you think chemotherapy, it's the end of chemotherapy? This was after what's called the Resonate 2 study. It was a Britain of study with that ladies who CT scan the show. And she says, well, Patrick, do you think this is the end of chemotherapy? And CLL says, oh, yes, absolutely. And the other three guys in the panel, I just heard them going, <sighs> but I think, maybe I was a bit previous, but I do think my answer was right. Anyway, thanks very much. Okay, uh, absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Thornton. Professor Thornton has very kindly agreed to stay back for uh, a little while more. We're not sure we're going to have him at the end for our Q&A session, so we thought we'd pin him down now. We've handcuffed him to the chair for a few moments uh, to get some of your questions. So if you've got questions, we have a, a mic here. There's a gentleman in the middle there with a question straight away. Thank you, sir. And just raise your hand if you have a question, and we'll, we'll come to you next. You're very fortunate, and congratulations. Uh, anybody else uh, with a question? Yeah, gentleman here at yeah, the, uh, the front. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Um, 
I'm just going to record the answer to this. That's my eight o'clock on, on Tuesday morning, ta- Monday morning, taken care of. An, ans- an answer to your first question, which is an easy one. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, only if you require a blood transfusion, um, uh, your, your blood will be tissue type, but uh, the your rhesus type has no influence on your prognosis or your treatment. Um, the second question is, <laughs> <laughs> there are many excellent centres in Ireland um, uh, that treat CLL, and as you can see, uh, all of uh, the centres which signed up to CLL 13 recruited similar amounts. So I think the standard is, is, is good no matter where you go. But you should ask Rachel Fox that question. <laughs> and she might be able to give you a, a less PC answer. It's a, a very political answer, uh, Patrick. Congratulations. Um, yeah, gentleman here at the, at the front ha- has a question as well. And just anyone else, put up your hand and we, we'll, we'll come to you. Well, in, 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 in CLL 13, uh, I think we were, um, we were very fortunate to uh, be included in the German CLL group, study group. Now, I say the German CLL group, but that also now includes Israel and Switzerland and uh, the Netherlands. So it's mo- most of industrialized Europe and, and, and the, the UK were doing something very similar. Um, and in Germany, a lot of these drugs are reimbursed as soon as they get licensed. So they're very progressive trials and there tends to be no need for a placebo. Uh, And so all of the arms in CLL 13 were very effective treatments, including the one you had, FCR. Uh, And those those trials began, uh, and you're talking a thousand patients throughout Europe, uh, which recruited very quickly, and those trials began. And the, the other trials which began in America, which have now come through, uh, you know, the, you could say, well, they've already answered the question. Um, but you can say that that trial had a good design because the two things, the what you would call experimental arms was three quarters of the patients. Now, that is a huge leap of faith to do that, to have three quarters of the patients not have what's called your gold standard treatment, which is proven for 10 years, including yourself, including FCR. So that was a huge leap of faith to have the majority of patients in your experimental arm. But there was so much faith and belief in the science of these drugs that that was the right thing to do. And that has been proven the right thing to do uh, in the other trials which were presented at, at ASH. The next trial, CLL-17, will all have, I can't, I'm not allowed to say, but a certain backbone, um, which is very effective. So all the treatments, nobody, all the treatments will be extremely effective. They will all have a novel agent in it. Uh, and uh, either single or in combination. So all of the treatments are good. If you want me to say to you what we should do in the, the absolute future when we have the answers to everything is, not everyone will need a triplet, which is an antibody and venetoclax and ibrutinib. Some people might be fine on just one drug. And there's other debates which have come forward. Can we stop treatment to ibrutinib? Do you have to continue it forever? We, we, we do know there's heterogeneity, and there's about three different types of CLL patients. That person who will never need treatment at all, that person who will do reasonably well about treatment, and that patient who will relapse quite quickly. So I, I don't think everyone needs a triplet, but I still think we can continue. Because you could say, well, is CLL-17 transfuse treating everybody? Doesn't need to know what the P53 is, doesn't need to know what their NGS is, or what prognostic markers they have. I think we still do, because we can... Uh, we can refine our treatments to give the triplets to the ones most at risk and save a Britain of circulation for the people who are less at risk. The one thing I do believe is that chemotherapy is gone. Okay, you're In answer to your question, no placebos in any of the trials for CLL in Europe. Okay. Um, Maybe that's all I should have said, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a good answer. Yeah. Uh, uh, does, um, where did I see a lady at her hand up there? Where was it? Sorry, there, yeah, in the middle. Sorry, excuse me. Can I just say before I go to you for a question, we do have some questions on the slide that came from the audience initially, so yeah, we definitely. might try and get some of them are clinical questions. Absolutely, yeah, okay. So. 
Well, it, it, it shows that you're likely to be in one of the pro better prognostic groups. To answer that question comprehensively, it'd be useful to know whether you have a mutated or non-mutated immunoglobulin gene, um, which not everyone does, but can easily be done. I mean, they certainly do it in Beaumont, they do it in James, and they probably do it in Galway as well. Um, and and that, that, that could give you a better idea. Now, one thing I would say is that the reasons for treating your CLL never change, uh, whether it be frontline, second line, relapse, and they never change why you need, why you need treated the, the chromosomes don't impact on that. They only impact what treatment you give. Um, so if you develop symptoms, hopefully you won't, uh, you're less likely to with that genetic profile. But if you develop symptoms, if your disease needed treatment, those tests need done again because the fact is you're P53 negative now doesn't mean you always won't be. I know you're P53 negative now because they would have done the full fish panel, including P53. But if your condition changes, if you, if you develop progression, hopefully you won't. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a gentleman where, oh, there at the back, that's at the pillar. And then uh, we might get to one or two of the questions. Yeah. We'll just get to that gentleman first. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Nick. And I just Should remind I everybody up? as well, well right, so try you're not to make yeah, yeah, your fine. questions too personal as they probably can't be answered. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a, a really good point. Just let's try and keep the questions, Jim, because obviously it's very difficult for Patrick. He can't remotely uh, diagnose. So we might just sort of keep it general, uh, understandable that people have very specific questions, uh, of, of course. Great question. Yeah, it's a very good question, and um, the uh, you could argue that the only reason that people don't get frontline abrutinib vernatoclax now is fiscal. Um, but let me uh, the relapse argument is very easy to make. Uh, to give someone bendamustine rituximab for six months for just eighteen months remission, and then they end up getting abrutinib anyway, makes no sense. Um, there are many conditions. The argument, the, the fiscal argument for Brutinib is that you continue to take it forever. Uh, and so therefore it's a chronic increasing uh, burden on the taxpayer to treat this condition. But it isn't um, significantly different from what we already pay for for other conditions like myeloma and other conditions. And I'm not saying it's a, a cancer competition, but I know what the prices are and they are similar to many other uh, long-term maintenance treatments that we use. That's the first answer. So they are expensive, but similar to other anti-cancer treatments. I think the way forward uh, perhaps is what's called a finite treatment, where you have treatment and it stops. That's probably going to be two or three years and, you know, and get in, the, in an MRD negative population. Um, but uh, I, I, all the arguments that are made, the reason that Abrutinib is licensed and the reason Fanaticlex is licensed and reimbursed is because these financial arguments were made to the HSE uh, and were found to be prudent financial arguments or the government would not have reimbursed them. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Okay, uh, Nick, you had a quick question you wanted to ask? Yeah, it's just a very brief question. Just, just wait for the mic because there might be people in the end who can't hear. Yeah. Uh, Prof, just a very brief question. Is Exciting times. We're bringing these therapies further forward into front line, and obviously with the treatments of a fixed duration, the fiscal arguments are going to be much stronger. With, um, yeah. I think there is ibrutinib, veno, at the uh, venetoclax, yeah. venetuzumab over one year. Yeah. Fix coming in now for appraisal within the UK through Nice, um, and then we have um, other fixed two years already approved by Nice, which yeah. hopefully. So the question really coming there is, what are your thoughts with this new strategy about sequencing um, where, you know, you, we look at figures, not the response figures are, you know, tremendous, yes. but on relapse or should eventually relapse, what, where do we go from there? So the, f the first thing when you're talking about sequencing or minimal residual disease monitoring, the reasons for seat and treating CLL never change, whether it be frontline or relapse. So it's not, you're not talking about someone who's had a transplant, you're not talking about someone with AML or CML. So the reasons for treating somebody a second time 
uh, are the same, the lymphocyte count, the lymph nodes. So you don't need MRD serial monitoring to look out for early relapse in the majority of patients. Uh, with regards sequencing, I think that what will probably be, you're asking me, with a, it's a crystal ball question, uh, you'll admit that, but the, I think what inevitably we will do is we gather up the sequencing information um, and uh, we will have cohorts of patients who we know, no, we'll only need ibrutinib. MRG negativity is less important um, versus people who will likely develop a BTK mutation or a PI3 kinase delta mutation. And MRG negativity is much more important because your clone can't mutate if it isn't there. Um, so I still think the NGS prognostic markers are important to determine the high-risk CLL individuals who they are to try and achieve MRD negativity in them. The people who may have a mutated immunoglobulin gene or 13Q and have low risk of acquiring BTK mutations, low, uh, have more genomic stability versus genomic instability are those where perhaps a Britain bonus zone is enough for them. So I still think it's important to gather that information. Does that answer your question? We'll have time for one or two quick questions from the, from the audience, but I, I, I would like, um, Patrick, maybe just, yes. just a couple of questions. One, maybe the, uh, the research into familial uh, CLL. These are questions, Patrick, that they're, were sent in to they're, us they're, earlier they're, on. They're, I, yes, I did it. <laughs> so familial CLL is an entity where, if you have any lymphoproliferative disorder, uh, in a fa first degree relative, there's, whether it be lymphoma or myeloma, whatever, but it increases your risk of CLL. But remember, it's one in 20,000, one in 25,000, still a rare disease. So we don't introduce screening to family members. The interesting thing about CLL is that it, it, it does something called anticipation. So what that means is you see it in Hodgkin's disease that if you have CLL, if your father has CLL and you have CLL and he got it when he was he's 60, you'll get it when you're 50. Uh, and you see that in something called Huntington's Korea. So they looked for these uh, re re repeats that you see in Huntington's Korea on genes which get shorter with every generation. They didn't find them. And one of the things I did in the Mars, then we looked at the genes that um, we know happen in CLL like 13Q, 53, 17. There's another one called 6Q to see whether they were more common in CLL family members than non-family members and didn't find them either. So. The, there is a paper on it, um, my name's on it, um, but we, the, the, it exists, uh, uh, but we don't know the gene for it. So there was, I don't know if the research is still ongoing, but there, we certainly did it at one stage. Yeah? Uh, but it, we don't screen um, family, remember, I had a family that three of them had CLL, the other person had essential thrombocythemia, and the other person had a brain tumor, and that was their entire family. So. The, there is, we don't know what the gene is, but the majority of patients with CLL is what's called non-familial. But the familial versions do exist, but not common enough that you screen your family members. But it's important to tell your doctor. Yeah. Age profile, how, how significant is that? Um, does CLL in younger patients progress faster was a question we had. Well, not that it progresses faster. The progression will determine, is determined to a certain extent by your immunoglobulin gene and what other genetic abnormalities you have, but if you saw, but the fourth slide I showed, uh, the impact on life expectancy is worse if you're younger. Um, if you looked at the graph, compared to age match controls, if you get CLL when you're younger, there's a much bigger difference in age match controls if you're under 55. Now, hope, now the thing about CLL prognosis is that everything you tell someone is already out of date. So hopefully, uh, with all these no novel agents, it won't matter at all, because hopefully we'll, 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 we can be able to cure the disease. Patrick, the, the various questions on um, eye problems, um, do, do you want to deal with that briefly as well? Uh, it's, um, the, it was listed in the scientific profile of Ibrutina, but I only ever saw it once. You know, it, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a major issue for me. You know, but does anyone, if anyone else has different experience, but it was listed as some of the, one of the things you had to look for in the resonate trial. But I only saw, I, I saw dry eyes in a couple of patients, but never anything called iritis or anything very serious. But uh, we did have to have routine ophthalmology assessments of people on ibrutinib in the trial, but they're not in routine practice now. And it's not something I see. I see more arthralgia um, than eye problems. I 
don't don't really see it. Don't really see it. No. Yeah. Other side effects of treatments? Uh, do you want to deal with that one as well? That was another question that yeah. came in, Patrick. So, so the um, so the if you they're, they're particular for each. If we look at our brutinib, they talk about atrial fibrillation, high blood pressure, you get early diarrhea, and it increases the risk of bleeding. If someone's on our brutinib, it's important that if they're having procedures done, that the whoever's doing the procedure knows they're on it. Because it, be, it, it can increase your bleeding risk. So if you're having surgery or biopsies, you need to be off it for a few days. Um, the atrial fibrillation is something which can happen when you've been on it for years. So if anyone develops palpitations or shortness of breath and I've it, they should tell their doctor and have an ECG. Um, then the um, venatoclax, the, new, the, the main uh, most important side effect of that is that it kills the CIL cells very, very quickly and they die off very, very quickly and are flushed out through the kidneys. So when you're starting venatoclax, you have to start it at a lower dose and work up to it. That's called tumor lysis syndrome, and you have to prevent that by introducing the venatoclax over a six-week period, which most people do. They're probably the, the biggies. Okay. Uh, anyone else want to uh, ask a question? Brian, you're in the front here. Yeah, uh, stick um, your hand up, by the way, if you do want to ask a question. We, we have time for one or two more. Yes. I yeah. know you've done some research on Richter's transformation. Have you ever seen anyone present with uh, CLL or SLL and Richter's at the same time? Uh, have you ever seen that, or is it always a late development? If I saw someone who was said they're a Richter's transformation who never had treatment, I would ask for the histology to be reviewed. Um, I did research on Richter's transformation, and we looked at Richter's transformation after fludarabine, and a certain amount of them were driven by what's called Epstein-Barr virus. And uh, if someone has a solid organ transplant, then the, like a kidney transplant or lung transplant, they can get something called a post-transplant lymphoperiphery disorder. Well, the Epstein-Barr virus drives this lymphoma. So we looked at Epstein-Barr virus and people after fludarabine and found a cohort of them had pretty much like a PTLD. And so you can find Epstein-Barr virus in certain Richter's transformations. You can find almost like Hodgkin's type transformations. And not all Richter's transformations are the same. Uh, some of them do better, some of them do worse. Uh, as, a, in, as somebody who had early CLL, who didn't have a P53 deletion, uh, who uh, had not had any treatment, who had a big lymph node that somebody thought was a Richter's transformation, who had never had treatment, I would definitely insist on uh, that histology being reviewed because I would doubt it. And someone very close to you went through that very same thing, geographically close to you. Yes. Um, so in short, to answer your question, n n personally, no. And I, I think it'd be, I would definitely want that histology reviewed by an expert. Because your, your cells can be changed by a viral infection, even like herpes simplex infection and stuff, and they'll settle down again. So I wouldn't leap at that at an early diagnosis. Yeah. Okay, uh, three hands up. So can we keep going? Are, we okay for Are you okay? Yeah, I'll try. Okay, and then we go. Yeah. I need some adrenaline. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, yeah. your question. No. Um, the, um, the United States and Germany will reimburse a drug as soon as it has a license. And there is a process if an, for a new drug coming online is that, first of all, the drug needs a license. And uh, in America, that's called the FDA. And in Europe, that's called the EMEA. When a drug goes through usually what's called a phase three clinical trial in enough patients, it gets a license. They're usually called licensing studies. And when the drug is licensed, it means it can be prescribed. But as you know, these drugs are expensive. A is about five grand a month or something like that. And uh, so, you know, uh, that would be, on, be beyond the pocket of most individuals in the population uh, in Europe. So therefore, the drug goes through something called a reimbursement process where the pharmaceutical companies and the HSA meet. The pharmaceutical companies say this drug is brilliant and here's what we have to prove it. And uh, then the HSE decides whether they can afford to pay for it. And there's a bit of negotiation that goes on and that's called reimbursement. Now in Germany uh, and in the States, if a drug has a license that can be prescribed and is paid for by the state, that situation does not exist in Ireland. We're not too bad compared to most in Europe. Uh, Nick will probably be able to tell you the process through NICE and through England. It's a similar sort of thing, and they had the cancer drugs budget. Um, us and the UK tend to sort of have a sinusoidal 
curve up and down. Sometimes we're better than them, sometimes they're better than us in the sort of new cancer treatments. But in short answer your question, no. Um, uh, and that, that is uh, uh, the kind of discussions that take from 12 to 18 months from a drug gets a license to when it can actually be prescribed. Okay, uh, there was a lady at the back with her hand. Oh, sorry, gentleman there, yeah, okay. And we might, do we, we need to leave it at those, those three people with their hands up, yeah. If you have a P53 deletion, uh, you are a, a Britain is free, a licensed and available and reimbursed in Ireland. Okay. Um, if you have relapsed CLL, uh, a Britain is licensed and fully reimbursed and available in Ireland, as is Idlalisib. If you have, uh, if you're intolerant or have relapsed after uh, a Britain, Venatoclax is licensed and fully reimbursed in Ireland. The difference is a Britain and Venatoclax are not available frontline for CLL patients in Ireland, uh, uh, and venatoclax is not available frontline for P53 deleted patients in Ireland. Uh, as I've probably shown you, there is evidence to say that these drugs are probably better in frontline, and they are not, that's not available in Ireland outside the current trial, CLL13, which is open, and again, when CLL17 comes to Ireland in about a year's time. Okay, Thanks very um, much. Patrick is almost out of time, so just just two people with their hands up. If we could keep the questions really short, so we can. It's we probably can. my answers are too long. <laughs> I didn't like to say Anton Patrick. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that uh, lady there with her hand up, and then there's another lady. Yeah, yeah, and unfortunately, uh, we'll have to leave it there because Patrick is under real time pressure. I'm afraid. Um, for ibrutinib, they have follow-up data in sort of long-term follow-up data, and about uh, a third of people stopped it. And out of the third of the people that stopped it, half of them was because it didn't work, and the other half of them is because they couldn't tolerate it. So about a sixth of the people that are on ibrutinib can't tolerate it, which is pretty low. Uh, rituximab in combination with venatoclax and ibrutinib have been studied. Uh, it probably has an, uh, an additional... Uh, beneficial effect in combination with venatoclax, it's not clear whether it adds anything to ibrutinib. And a last question there, sorry, yeah. It, it does affect your platelets, so yes. you can have easy bruising on it. Mm -hmm. It's not really a reason to stop it if you can put up with it. Okay. Okay, uh, sorry to uh, people we didn't get to. I'm so, so sorry. But pa Patrick is on call today. Yes, Patrick is on call today, so we do need to know. Pat you, ne you never answered which, which hospital is the bit? No, I won't. <laughs> we'll let you away with that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are, we're lucky to have him uh, in our hospital system. We're, we were really lucky to have him here today. Uh, please give a big round of applause to <laughs> Professor Patrick Conklin. <laughs>